Good morning, church. Uh, that was not a very good response. Let's try that again. Good morning, church. Oh, that's much better. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as we uh, get underway today, I want to just highlight a number of different announcements. Um, you will see most of these in your um, bulletin insert, uh, not all of them, but the first is to uh, remind you that uh, farewell party for yours truly is being planned for Saturday, May 6th. So if you could mark your calendar for that day, uh, we're looking at a luncheon at Adelphia's, which will be delightful. Uh, so please save that date if you can to plan to join us. Uh, mission trip meeting tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock in the church library. If you're interested in finding out or perhaps being a part of our week of mission and service down in West Virginia. Hope that uh, if you're interested, please come or let us know that you're interested in coming. Um, there is a home Bible study that is going to get underway again for the spring at the home of Dave and Doris Carey. If you're interested in that, uh, details are in the bulletin. Uh, women that are interested in going on retreat, there's a women's retreat planned for uh, April. So if you are interested in that, the contact information is in the bulletin. Uh, very important, next Sunday, the, um, we will be hosting for two weeks, beginning next Sunday afternoon, uh, the men for the Interfaith Homeless Outreach Council. Uh, those men that are transitioning from homelessness to independence. Um, as you know, it's a big effort. So uh, we do need hands and help. On the back, on the glass, there's a sign-up sheet for supplemental items, things like coffee and cereal bars and different things like that. If you can donate any of those, just simply put your name next to that item on the list and make sure that if you didn't bring it today, that you bring it next Sunday because the men arrive on Sunday afternoon. So those supplemental items are appreciated and if you can't sign up for something but would like to make a cash donation, cash is always helpful, okay, for the supplies and the things that we need. How are we doing, Jeanette, on overnight hosts? Uh, are we still in need? Okay, so we still need particularly men if you're a man and you're within the sound of my voice and you can stay over one night, um, please uh, see Jeanette or let uh, somebody know on the team. Um, yes? Uh, Jenny's the one that's setting up. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Jenny Capano. So wave to Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Okay. So let Jenny know uh, with regard to that. Uh, we are updating the church photo directory. If you could take a minute, if you haven't already, to look at your information that's on the clipboards in the back to confirm or to update that information, we would be grateful for that. Also, a reminder that I will be at my prayer and study uh, week with the Shalem Institute next week. So please pray for me, even as I will be praying for you. Uh, Reverend Bob Santilli will be here next week uh, to preach in my place. Bob Mounts has a couple of quick announcements for us today as well. Good morning. Uh, just a couple of quick ones. Uh, the Zoe project that we put in for the grant, uh, we were not selected for that, but we will continue to uh, min try to find ways to minister to young adults in this community and this congregation. Uh, also, the interim pastor is the next step for uh, finding a pastor. Um, I've been in contact with ABCNJ and we will be looking for an interim pastor in the next couple weeks. Um, also the Greater Delaware, Greater Delaware Valley uh, Association it has a meeting um, May 7th and it's in Haddonfield and if you, you want to participate we'd like to send at least two people from this congregation um, just let us know for that. Thank you. Thank you Any other announcements for the good of the church? Yes. Uh, JDW uh, meets next uh, Sunday after uh, church. 
immediately following and we'd like any of the women uh, to come. We are going to be dispersing monies to different charities and things. And the other um, thing I wanted to mention is uh, if you're going to see the shack uh, with the group, uh, please see me with, uh, it's 9 9.50, 9.90, something like that. Um, going to get a, um, Cinemax has, you have to buy a, a seat. So uh, what we'd like to do is get us all together. So if you are deciding to go with the group, you don't have to go with the group, but if you are deciding to go with the group, please see me. Okay, so Jackie, if you're planning to go to the shack and we need money to pre-order the tickets, we'd like to sit together if possible, so thank you, Jackie, for that. Yes? Um, the 19th, two Sundays from today, any volunteer or anybody who wants to be a volunteer for children's ministry, we have a brief meeting right after church in the Buddy Munch room, so see me if you want information on that. Thank you. Yes? There's uh, been an announcement of bulletins. I've emailed out um, some of the deacon leads for different uh, teams of the church, uh, but we're looking to gather, to gather information about what's going on in the church. Uh, this is actually a process we started uh, before we found out Eric was uh, going to be moving on, uh, but just for our own church development, what we found is actually leads right into what we need to figure out as we start to move into the process of looking for a new pastor. Um, so what, we're, what I'm asking for is anyone who leads anything that's happening that the church has helped with, is connected with, that you reach out to the church for, so give me some information about it. Um, my email address is in the bulletin. And what I'm looking for is just kind of what it is you're doing, a general you know, synopsis of what it's about, what it's for, who's involved, who the contact person is, and that's whether you're collecting clothes for an organization, whether you're doing a small group meeting, whether you're just getting together a group of people from the church to hang out with little brothers involved. Um, it's all things we're going to be putting together, an information center that will be out in the um, lobby that will help people that are coming to the church know what's going on, and it will help us as we're developing you know, information as we start to look for a new pastor to get an idea of what the church is doing, and where we're going, and what we're looking for. Um, so if you're at all involved in leading something and you haven't heard about this or haven't been asked yet, I'm asking you now. So my email address is in there. Please email me whatever information you have. Don't worry about the form and I'll take care of that. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you, Matt. And also, finally, I just want to mention that um, um, close to a year ago, I think, we were uh, given um, anonymously a donation um, for a... Um, a a new camera for those that are watching online, and that has been installed. So uh, I just wanted to praise God uh, for the person that uh, that had made that donation possible because it really helps those who are not able to attend. And there are a number of people that are shut in or can't attend for various reasons that can watch online, and it allows them to really be a part of our church family. So. Um, yeah, wave at the camera. <laughs> All right. We love you. You know who you are. Um, so thank you. And um, as we uh, now transition from, um, from the things of the church family to the reason that we gather to praise Almighty God, let's turn our hearts as we listen to the music of the prayer.
Our call to worship this morning is printed in your bulletin. It is responsive, and it comes from Philippians, the fourth chapter. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I invite you to stand as we open in songs of worship.
Christian love and your soul to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to be Bless your name, and we offer our praise to you. It is just one gift that we can give. Lord, that gift, you tell us, means so much to you. To simply honor and glorify you. To take time out of our day, out of our week. To give to the one who has given us everything. A little something in return. Receive our gratitude, receive our praise today, and help the song continue throughout the week. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to join hands with the person next to you in the pew as we sing together today the Lord's Prayer. As we continue our time of worship, uh, we now turn to the time set aside for our offering. I remind you that um, all offerings can go in the basket that is in the front, including the special offering envelopes that will benefit the Deacons Fund today. If you have uh, other special gifts, um, please use the um, 
the appropriate envelope. Um, and also remember that um, I'm in the front here. Um, if you have a prayer concern that you would like to share, not a concern for the rest of the church, but you would like special prayer today, I'll be in the front to, uh, to pray with you uh, if that is your need today. Let's uh, offer this uh, prayer of offering to our God. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to both dedicate these gifts and to dedicate ourselves to you afresh today. But Lord, it takes practical things, hands, donations, help, to make a church family the incarnation of Christ here on earth until you return. It's an awesome task. It is one that does not happen by itself. So I ask, Lord, that you would extend your generosity to us so we can return it in this offering today. Bless gifts and givers as always. In Jesus' name, amen.
Could you please rise? time we would like to um, transition into a time of sharing any celebrations or concerns if you have a testimony um, about how God has been at work or where you've seen God at work in your life um, we'd love to hear that uh, also any prayer concerns that you might have Judy is going to bring the microphone around so our friends can now watch us in high definition and hear us in high definition uh, so just raise your hand, uh, and it looks like we'll start right here. Put it on your prayer list. Okay. Thank you. All right. Here. And Christy Marshall Riser, her um, husband just had surgery about a week ago. So it was uh, a problem, you know, that he's going to be out for a little while. Like he'll be going into work and then out for a little while. So it'll be a little while for recovery. What's his first name? Mike. Mike. Okay. All right. Yes, Charles. I would like to welcome Charlie Ackerman back. This is his first day back in three or four weeks, and he seems to be feeling better, so. Um, Peggy and Paul and Dot and I went to see Irene yesterday. She is uh, a little depressed, and so I would ask um, if uh, you could send a card to her, it would really help. Um, I'll have Kara next week put her address in the bulletin. If you send it to her home, Shirley can take it to the uh, rehab center. I think she'll probably be in the rehab center for another week. But she is a little depressed and she's mi missing her kittens, especially. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, there's some behind. Oh, there are hands everywhere now. Let's no, go all the way in the back. <laughs> Do we, do we celebrate that the gospel is here in this place? Prayer request, there will be most likely brothers and sisters throughout this world being persecuted for their faith. Maybe someone lives their lives today. So are we ready for the persecution comes our way? How would our faith hold up? Thank you, Paul. That's my prayer request. I have a celebration. Um, my niece, Megan, gave birth to um, my great niece, Brielle Elizabeth, on Friday. And as uh, we all know, children do not do what they're told. She wasn't supposed to be here till Tuesday. Um, but she had other plans. So she's here. Everybody's happy. Everybody's healthy. Yes, and that's, that's Bubba's sister Bubba's for yeah. those of you that didn't make all those connections. So. Uh, <laughs> That's, yes, we we're thankful she had a spike in her blood pressure that required them to go early, but everybody's doing well. Okay. I'd like prayer for my granddaughter, Christy, who has come down with Bell's palsy again and is severe from this time. Thank you. Okay, right behind you. Um, I would like everyone to say a prayer for my daughter who has a big speech on Thursday to get out of college with her doctorate degree. And I just want her to know that God is with her. Amen. Amen. What's the name? Madeline. Madeline. see you, Kathy, so 
I just um, want to say how I celebrate daily coming here to church. It took a couple times of great courage to come back here, and it's very ironic that I had to be certain that it wasn't my love for you <laughs> that brought me back. <laughs> I do love you. <laughs> but I searched for the spirit, and this is where I have found it. And I just want everybody to know that there is, for me, a uniqueness here concerning that spirit that I didn't get ready for you to leave so soon, <laughs> but that spirit will remain Amen. in unity Amen. of this congregation. And, and may I, thank you, and, and may I say that that's why I came here in the first place 20 years ago, because that spirit of Christ was here, and it didn't come with me. The spirit of the Lord is here, and the spirit stays where people continue to love God, to worship him, and to serve him. You do that. And God will always be in this place. Do I hear an amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, a couple more over on this side. Kathy's over there. I will, while, the, while the microphone goes around, uh, I learned late this week that Mark Averill ended up in the hospital um, <clears throat> with pneumonia, with some other complications. So please uh, pray for uh, Mark Averill. Uh, as uh, he's at Our Lady of Lourdes Hospital. Hi, I'd like prayers for Christine, Tom's wife. She had to put her, her dog down yesterday. This is the 10-year-old that she's had. She still has a puppy, but it was hard putting her 10-year-old um, down. Yes. It ended up having cancer, and it just was in so much struggle. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll pray with Christine and with all of you. I'm speaking into the microphone, but it's uh, Keith's urging me um, and doesn't want to do it himself. But please continue to keep Maureen Brady in prayer. She um, had, a, had a difficult time, um, came through surgery great, and is coming through recovery great. But she is trapped, kind of, at home. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, through... Uh, Keith, through me, ask you to pray for Maureen. Thank you. And, uh, and like um, was said earlier by Jackie, a card, phone call, or a visit by would make a big difference. So, uh, but warn her if you're coming, okay? Please do that. But if you can send a card or something else, that would be wonderful. Oh, yeah, okay. The tall man, I wonder who that is. <laughs> I just wanted to send out three prayer requests in different realms and stuff, actually. First, I want to continue prayers for the Gravener family and stuff during their time and stuff. Two, I want to express some safe travels. Um, um, one for uh, Karen and Amelia, actually, coming back from uh, Florida later this week, and also later this week, my uh, brother Luke going out to Germany, actually, for a few days because of... Uh, as part of uh, his semester and stuff, actually, what he's doing now at Rutgers and stuff. So I hope that'll be a great journey for him. And also, especially in light of uh, seeing the uh, play The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime yesterday, I just want to express a prayer out for anyone out there who feels like its main character, Christopher, who, who, is, who feels, who is kind of, in a sense, rejected because they are different and not praised or accepted because they're unique, if you know what I mean, and yes. stuff, actually, you know, and stuff. Just we got it, thanks. And that was four, by the way, but I'll, <laughs> I'll cut you a little slack. In the pastor's son, I'll cut him a little, cut him a little slack. Oh, oh still in the back. Um, 
Okay. I'm so happy to be back in church again. Yes. It's not good to be off. I miss it so much. Mm -hmm. And all my people. Yes, indeed. Amen. And still in the back row. Hi, um, we just need some prayers regarding some financial issues. Okay. All right, thank you. God bless. Okay. All right. You know, um, not every church takes the time to do what we do today. Uh, there are a lot of churches that are a lot bigger, and they, aren't, they really can't logistically do what we do here. But this is a real blessing to be able to share these needs um, together and to be a family together. Um, so let's join our hearts in prayer. Lord, um, I am thankful for the caring community that exists here and for the way that we can uphold one another uh, in prayer and in deed. Uh, we start by remembering those who perhaps seem far away from this circle, especially those that are suffering persecution around the world because of their faith. We lift up those brothers and sisters to you in places of war and of conflict and of oppression. We ask that you, that you guide and direct those in need. And we also pray and join will uh, for those who may be feeling rejected for any reason let them know, God, that your love extends to them, even in their loneliest moments. Uh, we thank you for the safe arrival of Rial. Uh, we ask your blessing on Megan and this new baby and uh, on the whole family. We join in praying for Christy, who is dealing with Bell's palsy. Uh, we pray for Madeline, who will be giving an important presentation this week. Uh, we thank you along with Isabel and ask your blessing on her. We remember Irene Note, Mark Avril, um, Maureen Brady, others who are dealing with illness. We join uh, Florence in praying for Howard and his physical needs. We uh, remember um, Christine Marshall Reisner's uh, husband, Mike, we thank you for Charlie. We thank you for those that are back with us, that have been in the hospital and are back now. Um, we join in our heavy hearts with Christine, who is still dealing with um, the loss of her husband, but now a beloved pet. We ask for all of those who are grieving, uh, the entire Malison family, an extended family of others who are grieving at this time. We pray for those who are dealing with financial issues today and ask, Lord, for your help and provision. We pray for Lily, Maureen, for travel mercies for those that are traveling. Uh, we thank you and we ask, Lord, for all of those who are on our prayer list, that you would meet needs and that you would remind us to pray throughout the week. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ask the young people that are here to come forward at this time. Good morning, everybody. All right. Raise your hand. Big people can raise your hand, too, but... Um, how many of you have been to a birthday party where there was a pinata? Ah, yes, yes. Um, well, I learned something about pinatas that I did not know this past week. What I read was, uh, now, everybody knows since you raised your hands, you know how a pinata works, right? You got the thing and you whack it with the baseball bat, right? And the candy comes out. Well, what I learned was um, that this started about 300 years ago down in Mexico. But it didn't start at a birthday party. It started at a church. And what they were doing was, they were making these, the monks were making these seven-starred pinatas. And the seven stars were the seven deadly sins. They were teaching them about some of the worst sins. And they said that you needed to take a bat and 
really work at it. You had to hit it hard. You had to hit those bad things hard to keep them away. But if you persisted at it, then you would gain the rewards, which was the candy would come out, okay? But you had to battle against those sins and against evil things in the world and bad things in the world, but you had to work at it, right? But sometimes, you know, the first time you hit the pinata, it doesn't always, the candy doesn't come out, right? You have to work at it. And that was their point. You have to fight sin, you have to fight bad things and keep at it. But if you persist, you will get a reward. And so that's where, what I learned about the pinata. And we know that that's a good lesson and a reminder for us. With God's help, we can make changes, we can fight against bad things and uphold good things, but especially fight against things like temptation that come our way, that tempt us to do something that we know is wrong. We have to battle against that, okay? And that's what the pinata was reminding us of. And Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, said that we needed to work at fighting off sin and temptation and that we needed to persist like an athlete, like somebody that's, that's working out, is getting ready. You practice, right? Football practice, basketball practice, you've got to keep at it, um, whatever it is. Um, but if you make sacrifices, if you keep at it, if you persevere, you can also win a prize. Now today, I don't have a pinata, but I have what comes out of pinata. So... You can, in a moment, now the thing I have to tell you about though before this is, this is your first test, okay? Your first test is, when you get your candy, you cannot eat it until after class, okay? Not now, but that's how you're going to learn to struggle, yes, Junior. I'm sorry? Uh, no, uh, but I think, um, I, I think you will enjoy what's, what's in here nonetheless. These are blow pops, okay? So um, lollipops with gum in them. So, uh, but you have to start fighting, right? Resisting temptation, right? By having it in your hand but not eating it yet, okay? So that's your first lesson, yes. Uh, let's see, the priorities are here. Cherry, great, they're yours, okay, all right, cherry, who wants cherry, cherry, okay, anybody want sour apple, ooh, sour apple, okay, uh, I think there's another, uh, watermelon, oh, watermelon, okay, all right, now, we, we still have a number of other flavors, we have strawberry, cherry, grape, what do you think? You can have cherry. Absolutely, you can have cherry. All right. Oh, and the rest is for me. <laughs> now, some of you big people, I might be able to, oh, you, I, I'm sure you'd be happy to take those off my hands, but, um, but we'll, we'll, we might give them, share them with some of the adults. But uh, with that in mind, now you got to wait. you got to wait, right? Not until after. But that's what, see, so you have to persevere, and sometimes you have to resist, right? Resist temptation to do the wrong thing and follow God and do the right thing, okay? And next time you go to a birthday party, remember where that pinata started, okay? Let's pray. Uh, God, thank you for um, the lesson that we have all been able to learn and be reminded that we have to resist and persist in order to walk your way. So bless these young people in their efforts to do right and to resist wrong. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Diane is going with you. We're going to continue our worship today uh, by singing, um, in a way, as a preparation for our communion service, which will come later. Let us break bread together. If you would stand and join me in singing number 699.
Our scripture reading today continues in our series in Mark's Gospel. Uh, This week we're in Mark chapter 10, and I remind you again that uh, I'm encouraging everybody to read the chapter um, before coming to church on Sunday. Make it a source of your meditation throughout the week, uh, and then uh, next Sunday, if you've read Mark chapter 11, you'll be prepared for the sermon. But today, Mark 10, chapter 7, uh, excuse me, verse 17 through 31. <clears throat> As Jesus started on his way, a man ran to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter said to him, We have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Let us pray. Lord, as we reflect on this scripture today, This encounter with the rich young man, help us to find our hope and our security in you alone, Lord. Help us to join in embracing the words of a saint of long ago who prayed, let nothing disturb you, let nothing dismay you. All things are passing. God never changes. Patient endurance attains all things. God alone suffice. Amen. In Matthew's Gospel, in Mark's Gospel, in Luke's Gospel, in all three of those Gospels, we find the story of the rich young man. And in all of them, we have the same phrase that Jesus uses in his teaching. He says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. For centuries, people have found this saying to be a hard one, a difficult one. In fact, the disciples, the very disciples themselves, found it hard um, because it seemed to imply that who could be saved then? That was their question, right? They were asking, who could be be saved? They recognized... um, that it was not merely difficult, but it was impossible for a camel to pass through an eye of a needle. And that was exactly the point of Jesus. He was saying it was impossible for us to do that on our own. Of course, he said later that all things are possible through God, so that gives us hope. But there's some very important things in this visual illustration that Jesus is given. 
Now, when we come across a hard saying like this in the Bible, most of us have um, one of a couple of responses. It's typical of most people anyway. Most of us will either try to tone down the hardness of the saying, try to to mute it a little bit because this is a hard saying, or uh, we will try to distance ourselves from the saying. And I'm going to talk about both of those things in a moment. But for a number of years, I want to address something because um, it, it, it's come up and it's been repeated so many times that a lot of people think that it's true. But there was a story that was circulating for a while that suggested an understanding of this particular passage that said, well, there was, you see, there was this gate on the city of Jerusalem that was called the, the uh, Eye of the Needle. And that uh, people would have to get off of their camels and unpack everything and kind of crawl through this gate if they were going to get in to the city. And they were suggesting that this was what Jesus was talking about when he was talking about going through the eye of the needle. Well, guess what, friends? There isn't any proof that such a thing existed in the city of Jerusalem. It was a, it's a great story. But you see, it feeds into that tendency that we all have to somehow um, mute uh, or tone down the hardness of the saying. That's not what Jesus was saying at all. He was saying it was impossible, and he was giving them a memorable way to remember that. Uh, So I wanted to kind of uh, put that charming story aside for a minute. If you've heard it before, I wanted to dismiss it. Let's get on to what Jesus is saying and get on to this other tendency which is um, we want to distance ourselves from hard sayings. And in this case, we want to distance ourselves from the word rich. Okay? We say, well, pastor, I'm not rich. Um, I can't pay my bills. I'm in debt up to here, maybe to here. My house is in foreclosure. I have next to no health insurance. So this story doesn't apply to me. Well, that's us distancing ourselves from the word rich. Um, When we come to hard sayings and we try to tone them down or distance ourselves from them, that's not the answer. And I would be letting all of us off the hook today if I didn't deal with this head on. Because if we don't deal with it head on, if we don't deal with the difficulty of this passage and these words of Jesus, we will strip the transforming power of what Jesus was saying from the verse if we don't deal with it head on. Now, that word rich. See, God sees the whole world. We see the part of the world that we live in. And we don't feel rich at all. Now, again, hear me. I am not diminishing the reality of the problems that you may be facing today. In fact, I don't know if all of you had breakfast this morning. I don't know that. But here's what I want to say. The truth is that if you came to church in a car today, and if you go home to a house or apartment that has running water and heat, if you had a choice of more than one pair of shoes to wear today, then This passage applies to you because to the world as a whole, we are rich. If all of those things apply to you today, then we are rich. But you know, this passage isn't really just about money. Jesus was pushing a little bit farther and a little bit harder. And this is where I want to go today. Because I think this story isn't as much, although it is about money, It isn't as much about money as it is about two other things, deeper things. And those deeper things are self-worth and security. Self-worth and security. And I'm going to explain those in just a few minutes. But I want to go back into the scripture passage with you. If you still have your Bibles open, I want to invite you to uh, remain there in Mark chapter 10. And, And let's just review the story again. We're told that a young man approached Jesus with what appears to be a very honest question that he's asking, uh, not like some of the trick questions that the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees often ask Jesus. And he says, good teacher, 
What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, you know the commandments. Don't murder, don't steal, don't give false testimony, etc. Um, and the man says, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. Right? Now let me stop there for a moment. Let's peel back another layer of what's going on here, the subtext and what's happening between Jesus and this man. I think that there are two core needs of all human beings across the planet. I just mentioned them a moment ago. Needs for self-worth and security. And it appears that this man's self-worth was attached to his keeping of the commandments. He was very proud of the fact that he kept all the commandments since he was a young boy. And I think this is the key. I think that Jesus was seeing behind the fact that he had kept the commandments and that he thought that through his own efforts, he could be pleasing to God and be saved. That's where his self-worth was. I'm a good guy. I'm an upstanding man. I've kept the commandments. His sense of self-worth was connected to what he did, what he could do for God. Not in grace, not in forgiveness, not in those other things. And Jesus seems to pick up, I think, on this little hint of moral superiority, and he says, no one is good except God alone. And then Jesus, I think, is about to test this man's sense of his self-worth, worth that was coming not from God, but from his own efforts. And Jesus was also about to test his sense of security, where his security lie. And I love verse 21. This really shows me the heart of Jesus. Jesus wasn't there to berate this man or to embarrass him. It says in verse 21, it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Uh, that, that's just such an important part of this passage that might be easy to, to skim over. Jesus loved this man. He wanted to see what was best for him, and he knew that he had to confront him. So the motivation of Jesus was not to embarrass him, it was to challenge him to grow deeper in his faith, because that's what he needed at that moment. To move from a, a surface religion to a much deeper faith in God himself. And it seems that Jesus also discerned that this man's sense of security was rooted in his finances but not in God. And so Jesus says this, he says, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. So Jesus, see, he's, he's testing what his self-worth and his security is really in. See, it isn't as much about money as what upholds us what we hold on to. We're told that this man went away sad. And as I see it, Jesus is, is challenging this man's sense of, which is really a false sense of self-worth. He was proud, keeping all the commandments. And his self-worth was tied up in that, not in being a child of God. And Jesus is taking away that false sense of security from him. False sense of security and, uh, and a false sense of self that is based on what he could do and the balance in his checkbook. Now look, there is nothing inherently bad or evil about wealth. Nothing. Nothing at all. It's a tool, though. The difficulty with money, and this is the thing that Jesus teaches in many different places, is that like nothing else, it can deceive us by lulling us into a false sense of security, being secure in something other than God. And that's its chief problem for all of us. No matter how long we've lived, no matter what it is, it still trips us up. Our sense of worth and security buys into the world's sense of security and worth by checking the balance in the checkbook. 
That is not, that is not, that is not why God values you. That's not why God loves you. It is by grace. It is through forgiveness that God loves us, values us, cherishes us. And the problem is that we turn to God's good gifts of success or wealth or whatever it may be and look for our security in those things rather than in God. And keeping the commandments, Jesus taught that the commandments were there to help us, yes, but they were not the end all. And they were not a way to achieve salvation. They were there to show us our need for salvation. Amen? Because nobody can keep the commands. And this man had turned the commandments into a way to feel better about himself and even better than others. Here's the truth. No matter how secure your investment is, it's going to go away. Some of you have seen the painting in my office, right? The hearse pulling the U-Haul. You can't take it with you. It's all going to go. It's all going to be gone. And 1 Timothy 6.17, Paul writes this uh, to Timothy. He says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. See that? Not to be arrogant. Your self-worth isn't from these things. Okay? Nor should your hope be in wealth. But he says, um, but to what? Put your hope in God, right? There it is, right there. To put your hope in God and not in what you can accomplish and not in what you have. You know, we can diligently strive to gain money or status or influence in our lives, uh, even a modest amount of that, to feel good about ourselves. But that will never satisfy. We know that. You already know that. And yet, it trips us up. It continues to trip us up. Because every day, we're faced by people who live according to that reality. We need self-worth. We need security. But only God can ultimately fill those needs that we have. In Jesus, we find the source of rest, eternal rest, that allows us to cease from our striving and allow God's Spirit to fill those places, to fill those needs that we all have. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. We strive. We seek. We press. But Jesus knows what we need. He knows that we have these needs for self-worth and security and that he is the one that can fill them for us. I think all of us in one way or another, we, we do what this young rich man does in this story. All of us will fail like this young man if we continue to insist on going down that same path looking for self-worth and security in something other than God. And so, as always, we need some application, right? I already showed you that this isn't about somebody else. This isn't somebody that lives out in the suburbs, the richer suburbs. This is about all of us. This is about all of us. And so I ask you, where does your self-worth come from? Does it come from your work? Does it come from the approval of your peers? Does it come from your relationship with your family or the size of your paycheck? Does it come from the things that you do for God? Or from the fact that you're a child of God, period. That God loves you for who you are. Not the things that you do, but because... You're his beloved. You are forgiven. You are free. You are accepted, not because of the good things that you've done, but because of what? God's grace. That's why you're valuable. Jesus didn't go to that 
cross for you because you had a certain amount in your bank account. Jesus didn't save some, he saved all, offered his salvation to all. In fact, he came and said, I'm going to give priority to the poor people. These are hard sayings. Jesus challenges all of us, even in these words today. So be advised. You cannot find salvation or security in your bank account balance. We should have learned that in 1928, 1978, 2008. Whenever the economy goes sour, we're reminded that it isn't about those things. But then we fall back into the same old, same old. We are here today, and I am here today, to remind you of what Jesus said to this man. As he speaks it to us. Self-worth, security, where are they for you? Be honest. And if you're honest, and if you see your need, Come to the Lord again today. Confess that you've put your security and your self-worth in something else than where it should be. I'm going to give us a moment <clears throat> to, to just consider that and to allow you a moment to reflect on that and to confess if it is appropriate, if your self-worth has been put in something else if your security has been in something else. Lord, forgive us for putting our self-worth in a place where it does not belong. Help us to be reminded again today that self-worth cannot be manufactured and that security is really a gift bought on the cross for us. Help us, Lord, to be humble enough to admit these things, that no one can pass through the eye of a needle, but with God, all things are possible. Amen. As we turn toward the communion table today, I want to ask those that are serving to come forward and have a seat um, up here along with me. Uh, and as they come forward, I, I want to share a little reflection with you that involves a picture. This is a painting of the crucifixion. Um, and I want to just share a few observations about it with you. It's a little bit hard to see, but um, there are some interesting aspects to this scene, this familiar scene to us. One of the things that I notice is that there is a tree. Jesus is actually being nailed to a tree with a cross beam across it. Reminded of the tree of life, the tree that stretches from the Garden of Eden to the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. We see in Jesus his look, his gaze upward, looking to the Father's will and not his. We see circular shapes around the face of Jesus that the love of God radiates out from his face. But also there was a bullseye on Jesus that he was targeted to suffer and die so we could have new life. We see some of the colors of life, some of the yellows and blues and greens that radiate out from him. And it's a little harder to see, but in the, in the painting down in the bottom, there's, there's kind of roiling reds, and it's almost like fire that's there, that is being pushed aside. And at the very bottom, which is kind of cut off, there's a little bit of an arch that implies 
the empty tomb, that it is emerging even at this moment. I want you to use this picture as a reflection as we break bread together. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread in his hands and he broke it. And he shared it with his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this remembering me. Lord, we do this in remembrance of you and we ask as we partake of this bread that we would consider again your broken body that we see on the cross and the love that radiated from that place on that day. Amen. Just raise your hand and I'll be happy to bring that to you. Let us remember together the gift of his broken body. Scripture says that Jesus then took the cup Again, he gave thanks and praise, and he shared the cup with his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant, shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, remember me. Lord, we do remember you today. We ask that our reflection on 
your gift, your suffering, and your resurrection would lead us to a new place of dedication to you. I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's remember Jesus together. And now as a sign of our unity in Christ, I invite you to stand to move to the outside aisle. We'll make a circle or a, I don't know, squiggly circle or something. And uh, we'll sing together. come this way a little bit. Peace.